Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 504. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources and joining me on the line from just a few miles away this time, it is Ryan Spain. Ryan, welcome back on the show. Hey, thanks, Marshall. Great to be here as always. Yeah, love having... Uh, so So this week, uh, Luis was doing a conference for work and... You know, he said, I can probably fit in like between this meeting and this event thing. And it was like one of those things where like he could have maybe made it work, but it probably made a lot more sense to just say, no, 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 just go do the conference and uh, we'll have a guest. And the truth is, you know, Luis and I both like the idea of having people come on. And of course, you're my go-to, Rye. Uh, I love having you on the show to get your perspectives on Limited and uh, Magic in general and also Arena, since you're kind of a specialist these days when it comes to that. And we will, in fact, be talking quite a bit about Arena and the, where that's at for us limited players uh, down the line here. I took some questions from listeners, namely from patrons, and uh, as usual, they came up with some really great stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna put you to the test today uh, on that, and we're also gonna be talking some M twenty because I know that you've been drafting a ton of it on your stream, and I want to get your take on it. I want to know yeah. where you're at on on the format. So before we get into that, got to mention our our sponsor channelfireball.com that's place to go for all things magic related on the internet whatever you need they're gonna have it and uh gp vegas gp vegas that's coming up soon in just another uh well about a week week and a half or so i think it is uh gp vegas will be underway maybe it's like two weeks actually but anyway and uh yeah if if you haven't signed up or, or gotten lined up for it this is uh this is time to do so this is the premier magic event of the calendar year it just is the gp vegas has become the de facto uh magic convention for lack of a better term uh it is the place to go if you're a magic player you will find whatever it is that you're into there uh every aspect of the game every type of player will be there and uh, you can kind of find your crowd and uh and do your thing you know if you if you if you like jamming games of commander they're going to have that if you're a competitive player like many of the listeners of the show are uh, there's two different grand prix happening there there's modern and also a limited one which is modern masters uh, there's going to be coverage i'm doing covers louise a bunch of others it is going to be super awesome so please check it out i'll put a link in the show notes for that uh if, if you want to uh to partake also the show is brought to you by you via the patreon oh actually I'm, there's one thing i wanted to mention about the gp as well cool thing that CFB is doing. You can order your cards on the website and pick them up at the GP. They will uh, they'll get your order together and send it with everything else to Vegas for the GP. And uh, that way you don't have to pay for shipping. You can just walk up and say, all right, I'd like my order. And then they'll grab it for you. And boom, you got your cards uh, right there for the GP, whatever you need. So get your order in for that as well. That's a neat little, uh, little bonus. Uh, again, the Patreon, uh, this is uh, a way that you can support the shows and creators and and whatever that kind of make your day a little better or make you better at magic in our case, hopefully, or whatever it is that they add to your life. Uh, you know, this is a, a fantastic model that just didn't exist before. And it's been around for about five years now. And it's really kind of changed the game for content creation in a beautiful and fantastic way. Basically, in b before uh, crowdfunding like this existed, if you wanted to make content consistently and in a high quality, you know, that takes time, money, effort, dedication, all these things. And it was really not worth it to do that if you were like a functioning adult, because what would end up happening is you need to have a regular job and then you have to do these things in your spare time. And that would bump out time for whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, besides this, you know, whether you have a family or, you know, you're pursuing other interests or traveling or doing whatever it is that you're doing. And the way that the model was set up was that uh, any content that was produced basically had to be for the widest possible audience, the biggest group of people possible to listen to it. If you listen to to radio, uh, traditional radio or or watched uh, movies and TV and stuff, this was all uh, aimed at the biggest audience because then they could capture the greatest number of potential advertiser targets uh, from there. And that meant that if you had something that was about something that a lot of people liked, but not as many, uh, you know, as the, they would watch like a nationally published uh, TV show or a radio show and a more niche audience, you really didn't have a place. There was really no way for you to, to, to get your, your show out and do it again at a high quality consistently over time, you know, with good personnel and all that kind of stuff. 
And then everything changed. Uh, now we can be laser focused because what you can do as a viewer and a listener is if you do have interests that are more narrow than the broad public stuff is you can support them on things like Patreon. You can go on there and say, I love magic. I love drafting just like Ryan and I and Luis and everybody that's done the show did. And I want to get better at it. And so I'm going to support these guys or, you know, whatever it is that you're into. If you're into, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, whatever, uh, like I like watches, for example. Right. And, you know, that's not a mainstream enough thing to make a big TV show about, but it is definitely mainstream to make uh, podcasts about or to make videos about or to make a web uh, website about. And this is a way to sort of laser focus uh, that type of content. And it is a beautiful thing. We have one, of course, patreon.com slash limited resources, but you'll find many, if not all of your favorite content creators uh, end up over there because it just seems to be the, the best model to do so. So please do check that out, patreon.com slash limited resources. And if you ever wondered what it was, now you know. Crack a pack. You ready, right? Oh, yeah. What are you hoping to open here? Uh, what do I want? Can, well, I I don't pass Risen Reefs. I'll take take one of okay. those. All right. Um, do, do you take Risen Reef over Murder? Pack that's one, a good one. question. Yeah, I, we got that on uh, uh, on Twitter. You know, a lot of people will send us their, their pick questions, like me, Ben, and Luis. Often uh, we'll be on the same threads with what would you take here? And I saw that one and I'm like, God, you know, I don't think I've actually had that choice yet. And, yeah, I haven't uh, had it yet, but I don't know. I My, my gut says to take murder, uh, you know, for the higher chance that it'll make the deck and it's consistent excellency. But boy, the the high end, you know, the top end on a risen reef is is higher than murder by a significant Absolutely. amount you know i mean like, ben, ben stark was saying that the in this format in particular and i agree with him like one for one removal isn't as necessarily important as game changing uncommons mm -hmm. right uh yeah. and and of course risen reef is exactly that and i think if risen reef mm -hmm. were one color it would be no contest agree it's only the fact that it uh, takes two colors but basically, when I am in elementals, I'm usually in 2.2 colors anyway. You know, there's mm -hmm. you're, you're splashing one of them, and generally you're using green to help with the splash. So I almost think of Risen Reef as a green card for elementals. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you're going to try and go the other directions with it. I think my habit on Arena would be actually to take the Risen Reef, mm -hmm. but... It's got to be close. And I know some people who have had great success just not forcing outright, but leaning heavily towards Demir on M20 mm. on Arena and having mm -hmm. a lot of success with that. Just staying away from the elementals yeah. thing. So mm -hmm. I know some people who would snap up that murder and not look back and happily trundle towards Demir hmm. control. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think in the end, I would actually take the Risen Reef. Uh, like I said, my initial inclination was murder for those reasons. But, you know, I, I my gut says to go with Risen Reef. The high end is definitely there. And like you said, uh, it can be pretty easy to get it into a red green deck, even if you need to. Right. Anyway, let's get into this pack. First card out is Aerial Assault. Uh-huh. Fine. Uh, I, I first picked that the other day over a red Cavalier. Wow, really? Yeah, I misclicked. Okay, I was like, <laughs> holy smokes. And then we 5-0'd. We oh, no way. No, <laughs> yeah. no justice. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Convolute is next. That's a two and a blue counter target spell. Unless the controller pays four. No, we don't want that here. Marginally playable in a rough deck, but not a go-to card or anything. Right. Uh, Goblin Smuggler, the two and a red 2-2 two, two Haster, and you can tap it to give another... Tur Truly one of the power two or less unblockable. One of the key commons of the format, really. Uh, a lot of we we talk on limited resources a lot, and I talk on my stream a lot about what's the plan, how are we winning, what's you know great. You've got some good cards, but how does this deck actually win? Mm -hmm. And you know, smuggler plus two power creatures is an answer to that. It really is. It, it yeah. when it stalls out, the smugglers become must kill. I have spent the last month worrying about smugglers on the other side of the board and trying to get my own down so i think it's a very important card yeah for sure uh next is feral abomination not an important card five and a black five five death toucher uh vorst claw for green green for a seven seven it is an elemental as it's well it's great that it's an elemental but you want to pick those up late just like most yeah. big dumb beefy five and sixes yep 
Uh, Griffin Protector. That's the three and white, two, three flyer. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it gets plus one, plus one. White is the consensus worst color in the set, and I agree with that take, but it is not unplayable, especially in blue-white skies. So, <clears throat> And the bots have been updated enough that they don't like white either. So mm. you can generally get the white you need on Arena if you, uh, if you do end up pushed that direction. But if you get pushed that direction, I like blue-white. And in that case, uh, this uh, four-dot flyer is, is a nice solid addition to that, but we're nowhere near first picking it or anything. Right. Uh, next is Mind Rot. No. no. Ooh, here we go. Cloud Can Seer. Boom. Two ah. and a blue, two, one flyer, one and ETB is you draw a card. And That's it's an elemental. Current leader. Yeah. Not even close, right? Not this even close. Great. It might be. Uh, is that the best blue common? What's the best? Or what's the best common? Sorry. What's the best common? Is it just murder? Maybe it's just murder. Murder or seer. I think a lot of people would say seer. Yeah. Again, like, the one for one removal is not as important as it could be in other sets. You still want some, but uh, you really do want... I mean, a seer is a two for one. Murder is a one for one, right? Yep, totally, exactly. And that 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 actually does kind of sum that up. Uh, did you hear? We we did uh, on the show from Barcelona. We had a pick between Cloud Seer and Air Elemental. Where do you fall on that? I was leaning Air Elemental, but uh, if <laughs> when Ben Stark and Luis Scott Vargas both say uh, we take the. <laughs> The cloud kins here, I have to adjust my thought process a little bit mm -hmm. and say, okay, why am I wrong? Because mm -hmm. when both of those two are in agreement, I'm probably wrong. Uh, I think the thing that had me, like if, if Air Elemental were not an Elemental and had a different mm -hmm. name, obviously, then mm -hmm. I think it's not particularly close. But the fact that the Air Elemental is itself still an Elemental, ele an elemental for all those synergies mattered a lot to me. But the two blue matters and man, I... I I thought it was super close. I leaned elemental, but I will give the nod to the Hall of Famers and say it's probably Cloud can, Cloud can see you then. Yeah, that was kind of my thought process too. Uh, Tectonic Rift, no. Sedge Scorpion, well, fine card, but come on, Cloud can see her. All right, this gets to the uncommons. Let's get some business here. How about Wolf Rider's Saddle? That's three and a green for a artifact equipment. You get a 2-2 wolf when it enters a battlefield. Uh, and the creature gets plus one, plus one, and can't be blocked by more than one creature. The equip cost is three on this. That has fallen for me a bit. It's not, it's fine. But uh, mm -hmm. I think it's the worst of the three, effectively, uh, you know, what do they call those uh, art equipment that oh, came with creatures? Uh, uh, and, living, living. Yeah, living weapons. Weapon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, these are effectively living weapons and uh, with better creatures. And it, it like classically with equipment, the I, the three equip cost is too much for me. I just think uh, that's a little mm. too clunky. But I'll play it. I'm not. It, sure. It's basically to make every green deck where I draft it. It's just not a priority for me at all. Uh, next is Yerox Wave Crasher. This is the three and a blue four four. When it enters a battlefield, return another creature you control to its owner's hand. These are some of my favorite design space cards. The uh, this is a drawback unless you do the thing and then it's a benefit. I like I like hoops like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, bouncing your Cloudkin Seer sure seems like a great thing to do with the Wave Crasher, but I don't think we want to start with it. It's something you pick up when uh, you know you're in Elementals and can do that. I mean, I'd first pick it, but just not over Cloudkin Elemental. It's just not better than, than the, the old seer, flyer. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, was, Manifold yeah, seer, Key. Yeah, Manifold Key is one mana artifact. Uh, pay one mana, tap it to untap another target artifact, or three mana, tap it, target creature can't be blocked this turn. Isn't there a sunset show category for, like, cards that you hate to lose to? Or, like, yes, that you, yes. <laughs> that you don't yes, play? There is. <laughs> yeah. So I have lost to this card. I do not uh -huh. respect it. And as my viewers know on uh, Going Optimal, nothing <laughs> nothing salts me up quite like losing to a card i don't respect so yeah i have to I have to keep my uh, salt cap on uh, when i when i'm facing that one and it's doing work but mostly i'm happy when my opponent plays it cuz it's just not quite doing enough to justify a full card's worth it's kind of like yeah. uh the zephyr flight in that way you know these these yep. things that sit there they're they're, they're they 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 do nothing when they hit but then uh they can do stuff they can solve a stall but it's a high high cost to attempt to solve a stall with something that does not impact the board when you're behind exactly it, it does and it also does not help achieve a stall like you right <laughs> whereas is, like like yeah. take uh take what we we're talking about earlier the uh, goblin smuggler right mm -hmm. that also helps a stall 
but in a pinch, it can actually block a three, two and kill it. You know, like yep. in a, in a yep. pinch, it can attack itself. Like that's what we want. We want to be able to get out of stalls in cards that have other modes, mm -hmm. not, not yeah. just a card whose only mode is, Oh, we win you. We win that stall. That's just not enough quite for a card, even though in fact does that sometimes wins when there's a stall. Yeah. And that's, that's really, uh, you know, this is a classic, uh, quadrant theory, right? Like if, if you take goblin smuggler and you look at it when you're ahead, it's actually fine, right? It's a two, two haste. that helps pile on extra damage or get through, uh, maybe a little damage you wouldn't be able to. Um, mm -hmm. and if you're at parody, yeah, it's pretty good. Like you said, it can help break up a stall and that's, that's kind of what you want at parody when you're developing. It's actually pretty good there too. A two two with haste for three mana is nothing amazing, but it actually turn three can switch, turn sideways and and get in some damage. So it's good in all of those. And how is it when you're behind? Well, it's mediocre, right? It's a two two for three. Let's not get excited about it. But as you mentioned, it does have utility. It can block. It can double block, right? right double it can, block. Yeah, it Sometimes can sit there they have and do a four something. four, and you have your stupid smuggler and a generic centaur courser or whatever at least you can yes throw the double block and threaten the one for one there right and then if you look at the same criteria for the uh for the quadrant theory on uh manifold key right when you're developing it's terrible it doesn't do anything right i mean the only good thing about it is it only costs one mana so you can often sneak it into play where it's not eating up mana that you would have spent on something else anyway it's not exactly a compliment, right? It's not, right? it's not like go manifold key, right? When you're behind, it's completely horrendous. It's literally just a brick. Um, when you're ahead, it's okay, right? Put it in the middle ground. Like maybe it, it helps keep you a little bit ahead, but even then it, it's not really- It might really shorten the clock for. by a turn or something, but it's, yeah. probably, it's probably not doing that much unless you're ahead. The only thing it's doing for you when you're ahead is closing the game out. A, a, maybe a turn earlier or so such that yeah. they don't have an extra draw to to solve exactly the problem. and then the one time when it's decent is when you're at parity um and the manifold key is pretty good in fact it's the only category where it actually scores higher than the goblin smuggler because you can give any creature unblockable but that's a small benefit in that one quadrant and it fails miserably in all the other ones where the smuggler actually kind of holds its own so yeah. there you go that's why we don't like manifold key it's not enough, of course, for us to just simply tell you that we don't like it. That helps you, but it's much better if you know why. And that kind of uh, shows you the underpinnings. Now, our rare is a card that you actually have a lot of experience with today, Ryan. Yeah. Night the Ambusher. Ambusher. Yeah. yeah. I played with and against it a bunch on stream today. And mm -hmm. we're going to win, we'll slam it. We love being in green, and it's just great. Like, yeah, this card is so good. So this is the 2GG44 Wolf with Flash. Other wolves and werewolves you control get plus one, plus one. And this is the big thing, too. At the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast a spell this turn, you get a 2-2 two, two wolf creature token. And, of course, it's actually a 3-3 three, three as long as the ambushers on the battlefield. So I saw you do this multiple times, right? The kind of make hay while the sun shining approach where you actually had relevant plays that you could make from your hand, but your opponent had shown that they didn't have an answer for the ambusher in the moment. And so you just said, go, and just started spitting out wolves. and then. If your opponent pulls ahead of you or shows that they're going to be able to deal with the ambusher, then you can just empty out your hand after that. But I mean, you got to get your value while the getting's good, and that's what you did. Right. We had uh, they had a couple of two two flyer type flyers, and we dropped a big spider, and they showed no ability to be able to dis to disrupt that spider. We were at about eleven to fourteen life, I think, and we, we had 11, a second yeah. spider in hand. And my thinking was like the first spider is already doing it. If they, if they do manage to find something to deal with the first spider, they don't have enough power to like kill us out of nowhere. So let's, why would I spend five mana to add another three power to the board when I can spend zero mana and zero cards to add three power to the board. And what I did is uh, spend a few turns making wolves and building up a little more mana such that when I finally did decide not to take a wolf token on that turn, I was able to cast three spells. So, so we three spelled on mm -hmm. one turn and then went back to making wolves, you know? Yeah, so that's it's a, just so good. And, and, and you know, just as a, as a way to show how powerful a card like that is, your opponent ended up just conceding. Like, yeah, not, I was like, like you, didn't, you weren't even attacking for lethal or anything. It was just like you had just crushed them under the weight of the value that you had gained on board from the ambusher. Yeah, my commentary at the time was we were looking for our overcome. We had an overcome in the deck because it was kind of stall go wide. And I was like, well, I think our overcome is probably better than their inevitability. They might have, I was worried they had eight manas and they were black green. So I was worried they had like the uh, 
eight eight flyer you know, rare or whatever. But mm-hmm. and I, just as I was thinking about that, they scooped. And I was like, I guess they don't have that. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> <laughs> they they apparently uh, decided that they were going to lose to your board eventually. And like you said, you were actually drawing to something much better, which was an overcome to kind of blow the game open. But, yeah, but we were even in chat deciding about when we were going to not lethal. even wait for the overcome and just start yeah. turning sideways. And we were close. So it made yeah. it was not a surprise that they scooped it. No, up. not at all. So night pack, ambusher, easy pack one, pick one yeah. there. So let, let's talk about uh, M20 a little bit before we start talking arena. Um, you've been drafting it a lot, right? Yeah, on arena though. So that caveat, mm-hmm. but yes. Okay. Yeah. So what's your take on the format overall? Have you been enjoying it? I heard you say on your stream today, like somebody was asking when the next set would come out and you're like, well, it's going to be late September, early October, generally speaking. So uh, we still got M20 for a while. Yeah. And I'm not super sad about that. This might be a hot take, but I like M20 more than War of the Spark. Um, Whoa, that is a hot take. I really got quite sick of the Planeswalker gameplay of war of the spark oh, it's so sure, sure. swingy i'm so, i was so sick of being on either side of here is a planeswalker i cannot play because there's no protection for it versus here is a planeswalker that is now going to win the game because it is so well protected right i just mm-hmm, i mm-hmm. don't like those extremes i think it made for uh it, it broke my brain a lot uh i i i just didn't like and, and i was really tired of of that planeswalker metagame i really was yeah uh, worrying it, it about really one did every become turn. a thing yeah and so going back to a format that's just like nope uh every once in a while planeswalker shows up and it's really good and you got to deal with it uh but it's not this thing that you just deal with game in game out or or the frustration of your planeswalker sucking this game because you know i can't find a window to drop it you know mm-hmm. uh, i yeah. like that that's gone and i wouldn't like it better if it were like War of the Spark crushes M19, for example. I think mm-hmm. they hit a decent spot with this core set that has me going right now. We'll see where we're at by mid September, but I'm still enjoying it. I think the synergies make it fun. Maybe elemental synergies are a little strong relative to what else is going on. And of course, we would like to see white be a little more competitive to have a better well-rounded format which we can get into later if you want i don't know if you have any questions about the i i really like what maria had to say on the show about that uh when she was on yeah, yeah basically, hit it up let's let's talk about it now sure so um so, because th- this was going to our discussion about how to fix white in limited right yeah but to, mm-hmm. to wrap to put the bow on m20 that despite the problems with white I think there's enough synergies and interesting gameplay and interesting drafting going on to keep my attention going. We'll see how long that lasts. Okay. But one of the things that would give it even more legs is if white were a more playable color. And Maria mentioned on the show something that I wanted to reinforce. She kind of offhand tossed off a card. I think her design was like a, a one and a white for a 2-1 flyer that had a activated ability of like six mana and sacrifice it to basically Ob- o-ring something right ring. yeah you know, that was o-ring right. or to exile something let's just say exile something saying mm-hmm. o-ring is weird because it means it can come back or whatever but sure um, yeah, yeah just maybe uh l- like white has had this five mana exile a creature or another type of thing spell that we've seen a lot or exile a creature here's a bonus like it proliferate in war for example so mm-hmm. clearly white at five plus mana can get that type of ability i really like that design because i think where white is failing and limited right now is that White is inevitably part of the aggressive side of the balance of a set. It's just where it's supposed to be good is aggro. So R&D will consistently play to that role in the pie and consistently make it in an aggro color in limited. But as we've talked about on this show many times, limited is not about aggro, mid-range, and control. It's about mm-hmm. what shade of mid-range you are. Mm-hmm. And I think mid-range leaning aggro is not a great place to be for limited i don't uh-huh. like it it's it's it doesn't have legs it doesn't have a, a good late game and you need to draw things in the right order you need to curve out on your creatures and have the right tricks or whatever to to push that through or else it kind of fails and if you look at what where has white been successful in the last say two three years of of hmm. standard set drafting where has white been good i don't know the two places that jump to mind are M19, uh, where it was actually the, the best. 
Well, uh, can you remind me what the what yeah, was the good deck? Yeah, that was uh, 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 white red token go wide. Was oh right, right, right. Was yes. was monstrously that was the, good. The best in that deck. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was yeah, absolutely the best deck. And then uh, Boros in Guilds of Ravnica R and D release data saying that you know the the most successful decks were ones that you know curved out with uh, red white creatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, but note that in both cases it's Boros. It's not just white. It's specifically Boros. <clears throat> and in both cases. I think the success of it is due to the fact that the colors had the tools to finish them off. When you got them to eight life, ah. you could get there. Uh, in uh, Guilds of Ravnica, you had um, four mana, deal one damage to each opponent's creatures, and they can't block. So you had a nice yep. falter effect that could close out a game. You had six mana, deal uncounterable six damage. So uh, mm-hmm. six life was a very nervous place to be against Boros because you you know you know they could uh, finish you off that way. And then in uh, M19, there were, I believe, five different ways, four of them common and one of them uncommon, to pump your team for one or two points of power, Mm -hmm. mostly two. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's that was the key because you could just yeah. And there was no real sweepers, right? So Mm -hmm. you could build up your token army. And just had to survive until you could cast one of these one of these many many easy to find plus two plus zero your team plus two plus one your team plus one plus one vigilance your team all these ways to just finish and that's what made it the best deck in the format that it could finish and so when they make these sets in which white does not have the tools to break a stall late it it's pathetic why would you play white what are you doing mm-hmm. you're just hoping you curve out perfectly. And overrun them before they set up just a little bit of defense and then cast a divination and ruin you? Like, how sad, how bummed are you when you find yourself in a white aggressive deck? Maybe white green, everybody's favorite. White green. You play out some creatures, you get some attacks in, and then they play a 2-5 on the ground, and then they cast a divination. (laughs) Just like, well, this is over. (laughs) Done. I'm just done. I'm just waiting to die now. You go into waiting to die mode, right? Yeah, which is like the worst place to be. But if you had some tools in white that uh, I thought Maria's suggestion of a clearly aggressive, cheap flyer that could actually do something when it was no longer good at getting through in the Mm -hmm. air is exactly what the color needs. And that can be the bottom line is late game, late game power to match the late game power of the other colors in a way that supports what white is trying to do. Okay. And in a, and in a sense, they did that with M19 and they just really haven't done that since. And it'd be nice if they could figure yeah. out how to do it without making the only thing that pairs well with it red. Cause yeah. truly, I guess, uh, I guess you could say that uh, white, black, vampires was pretty solid in like Ixalan block as well. Yeah, Life gain synergy. You know? Yeah. They, 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 they tend to seed things like that into the white black decks yeah. where they actually have a, a shtick, right? They're actually doing a thing where white green often doesn't and white red often doesn't either. You just think, okay, it's aggressive. Right. Yeah. And it feels like, you know, like you were talking about an M19 and they had all those ways to pump. Also, they just made powerful cards. Right. Like, sure. When, when, you know, like, remember heroic reinforcements in that? Mm-hmm. That was the two white red sorcery for uh, that made two one ones and then pumped your whole entire team. And, the, and they had haste, too. Yep, I that mean, was that the was uncommon kind of, one of the five I mentioned. Yeah. And that's the one that just kills you. Right. Like, yep. you're just like, oh, OK. And that was a card that you feared and was very just raw power. Right. Like they could have turned any number of knobs on that card to make it worse. I'm not saying that they should have, but they pumped it up. They were like, this card's going to be great. And it was. Mm-hmm. And I think back to to uh, guilds and um, what's it called? Uh, Skylight Legionnaire was there. Right. Right. Yep. You nice, know, powerful and uncom- a powerful common there in, in the gold right. colors. Yeah, and that's the type of card that you would take as many as you could get, right? I mean, it's just the type of card that like hammered you in the air at common, and then you know you could combine it with a bunch of the really good uncommons in that guild as well. Um, and that's what I found interesting about Maria's suggestion was because I I remember thinking, well, that doesn't make any sense because that card's too good, right? I just like. I think it shows that like how much of a game designer I'm not (laughs) when like what you saw, right. When, when you hear her suggestion of like make an aggressive two drop that also is very good, you know, relevant and good in the late game, you said, okay, she's onto something here, right? Like 
support the aggression early still, but give relevant good things to do in the late game. Right. And that all I did was it say one time, whatever. Yeah. When yeah. I look at that though, I just focused on the card that, you know, like the actual card itself. And I'm like, well, that's like a rare, right? Cause it, it reminded me of, of that rare from, from M20, the, the one, one flyer that gets you another one, one flyer. Executioner and hang, hang, yeah, hang yeah. hanging something. Yeah. And you know, when I, so it's interesting because the point of the topic wasn't to create exactly the card, right? Like that, that like that's where I was off. It, the, the point was, how do you fix this? Right. Yeah, what's and, the, what's the design mm -hmm. space you want to work in? Yeah. And I, I think that you're right. I think she hit it on the head with the early late stuff, right? Yeah, like that, be, that like, makes more, cause my, my mind went to more power, right? Like, and, and I don't know that that's correct or not, but I was just thinking, why don't we have like a three mana card that makes three creatures, right? Three one ones. It doesn't necessarily need to be like spectral procession where there are three one one flyers, but maybe it is, right? And maybe that's a card that we see, um, you know, because we we see these type of cards tend to overperform when well supported, right? The one the token makers, sure. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe it's my I, and, personal and bias mean. that leans towards mm -hmm. the, I mean, sure. You could also make hyper good, hyper aggro white cards, but the risk there uh, in the balance of your world is that aggro is too good. And then you, you know, you don't yeah. want to swing towards too far towards like Zendikar limited. Right. Right. And if you solve the problem by giving white late game power, you set up more of the games that make us love magic, right? The uh, grindy choice filled. How am I going to, MacGyver my way through this and find a way, find a way out. What are my outs? What am I trying to, you know, I think that's really interesting magic. And uh, if you overload the aggro side, you may get less of that, but still uh, you need fun police too. So I think, I don't think you're wrong. I think uh, uh, mm -hmm. increasing the power of the white cards in general on an aggro level is fine, but yeah, the uh, it's the lack of late game mana sinks and things to do and, plan and even having the plans that makes it so depressing to play white it right really now is. because it's just like well we've stalled out a bit and i think i've lost i'm just now waiting to lose i, I can't even find a plan in the rest of my deck exactly and I, I want you, to you're have thinking about the top of your deck and it's all designed to curve out so it's right. cheap I, creatures. i want to have some stuff in my white decks that is an answer to what's my plan the board is now stalled what is my plan so for example mm -hmm. um one of your favorite formats you mentioned it on your top formats rise of the eldrazi mm -hmm. i was thinking about designs that support what i'm talking about here are some other examples and here's one i came up with and kind of in maria's vein but uh do you remember dawn glare invoker yeah, I do. The Don one that lets Blair you tap down their team. Yeah. yeah, it's like one in a one, uh, two in a white for a two two flyer for so you know, two two flyer for three. But for eight mana, you could uh, pay eight and tap all creatures your opponents control. So pure yeah. on full on falter, right? That's great. I love that card. Uh, white was not great in that format either. But when it was good, it was usually because you had that card and because it gave you a tool to finish off the job you started with your more aggressive approach to a very, very slow format, right? Uh, no, that's rise. great. Yeah. And and, and it, it was yeah. perfectly designed too, because it was a three mana, two, one flying, which meant it was very fragile, but also could chip in for relevant damage if left unchecked. And as the game went longer, it became, I mean, it, it, it completely took over the game. Eight mana tap all creatures target player controls means they don't get to attack or block for the rest of the game. Right. It just like is you like, go, uh, yeah, you just go like on your upkeep, you know, or you earned before it. I mean, you made it to eight, right? Yeah. Totally, totally. <laughs> it was, it was and it's a one toughness creature that effectively any removal spell ever printed can take out, right? And oh, that's was it like two one, even I thought it was two two, two one. But, yeah, yeah, so even smaller. But yeah. so you could you could adjust that design to be something like a uh, two one flyer for two that had a seven mana sacrifice to tap everything clause, you know, that you don't get to do it multiple yep. times, yep. but uh, we'll make it a little cheaper to get out and a little cheaper to actually do its thing. That would be a fine design for uh, what I'm talking about, uh, leaning into the aggro, but still giving it something to do in the late game. That's yeah. And it's, it's important to note the Donglair Invoker is common. Yeah. Like, you know, because if you pitch that card to me, I think my instinct would be similar and that I would say that's a common like eight mana, crazy kind of, and, you know, frankly, really powerful ability. I mean, again, uh, you know, you pay dear, dearly for it, but still that's, you know, it's a lot of, uh, that's a lot, that's a very, you know, profound effect on the game or whatever. 
Uh, but yeah, they did. They printed that at Common, so you can do stuff yeah. like that. So I think if right. uh, if Wizards finds their way towards more cards like that, white can find its way out of the wilderness, but they really need to rethink how white is fitting into limited and how far behind it is, how far behind the other colors it is when like even black and green are getting card draw now and red is getting, you know, like pretty good looting. And it was mm-hmm. just like white is just left in the dust on card quality and card card quantity at this point. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting too, because th- they've actually gone down right? Like you've seen other colors pick up pieces of the pie or versions of the pie from, from other things. Like you said, like uh, rummaging has become a thing that red gets pretty consistently now. And, you know, you'll see green with a lot of uh, ways to generate card advantage where that wasn't traditionally the case. And white used to have tappers and pacifisms. And while they did happen to print pacifism again, generally speaking, those effects have gone away and you have to pick up a, an uncommon to get, you know, kind of the powerful version of that. And tappers have become very conditional, uh, you know, expensive or conditional. Like they've nerfed that really hard where it used to be like, you know, pay one mana tap anything. Um, and, yeah. and those are gone now too. So, but they don't seem to have been really replaced. Like it doesn't right. feel like anything's, uh, you know, back. Well, I think they that. could, they could do also, uh, something, a design I, would think to more helping on your side of things like give white more powerful stuff to do early that helps the aggro like my, here's an example of a card i designed on stream to help with this problem and to point out how unfair the color pie is now when when scry first appeared it wasn't in all five colors right but it is now and okay. you take a look it's a card like preordain right a single blue mm-hmm. mana and it says scry to draw a card mm-hmm. so good it was it's banned in modern Right. Yep. Yep. Uh, but it limited is. is a diff- is a different beast. You know, cards like that get better as the quality of the cards in your deck go up. So limited, it's pretty safe. And we think of that as a blue effect. But why is it blue? Every card has dr- draw a card for your cheap spell, and every color, sorry, every color has draw a card for cheap spell, and every color has scry now. You could make mm-hmm. a white preordain, and it wouldn't break the pie in any way, other than the fact that. Generally, you don't give scry two to non-blue colors. Mm-hmm. So my idea for a card was like uh, uh, also the power of, of preordain is the fact that you can do it on an empty board. So what about a single white mana, uh, tap target creature, scry one, draw a card. Mm. That's cool, right? Like That's very powerful. Yeah, it, like a, it, a minimal onboard effect attached to a, a powerful cantrip. Yeah, That's and nice. you can just you can cycle it, but you need a creature out there, and it supports the aggro thing. But if it's you're stalled out, you can at least cycle it on anything and and get a scry and a draw. Anyway, that's a kind of little tool, non late game tool that I also think they could find to just give white its card draw, even if it's on. Uh, maybe you can't give white a divination, but you can mm-hmm. give white sweet, sweet, sweet effect draw a card mm-hmm. and not break the game or anything. So do yeah. that. You know, I like that. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, what about uh, getting back to, to M20 overall? Uh, what about on Arena? Uh, you 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 draft effectively exclusively on Arena these days. Yes. Um, are, what are the bots undervaluing as far as either cards or archetypes or what's what's good on Arena? Well, the bots just got an update today. And I so I don't have my finger on the exact pulse of what's going on currently. But uh, before the update today, the uh, Weaponsmith bow tech was pretty undervalued by bots. Mm -hmm. So you could, uh, like today, uh, on on my second draft, I had a deck with four bows in it, which, (laughs) you know, you can, and no Weaponsmiths, by the way. I was arguing that uh, I actually don't want to, if I don't have Weaponsmiths, I don't want one or two bows. I want three plus bows or none. Uh, and the reason and just why just try to assemble, assemble Voltron and yeah, mow because stuff down. a single bow is often not very impactful, but yeah. it's rare that two bows isn't. And yeah, two bows is gross, and three bows is hard to lose from. I think I lost from three bows today, but I just ran out of uh creatures mm-hmm. that not that I didn't have enough in the deck, uh, I just didn't have a lot of regular removal, so my bows were the removal, but anyway. Uh, bows were still coming late. We still got some late bows. So I think you can still do the collect, collect them all on bows and mm-hmm. do some damage. But, it, you know, 
don't just run run one random bow for no good reason. Um, you, you're gonna want to want to look for multiples there. Uh, Elementals had been somewhat undervalued, which is why we were getting, you know, I think Risen Reef historically had been undervalued. I'm sure, like, it's really hard for me to speak to this now because I've had exactly one draft under the latest bot reset. Okay, and so well, ra rather than try and predict where the bots are at, I will say that, sure, they're going to shift again. But as has been noted on the show many times, the issue with the current bot system, which I helped make, by the way, I know I know <laughs> I don't know what they've done for it with it since I left, but I know what it was intended for and uh, how it was built when I was still there. And uh, Rocket. You know, it's 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 in a place where it's inevitably going to lead to some something is going to be undervalued. You can always mm -hmm. if the bots cannot adjust on the fly to the evolving metagame that is limited, then there's always going to be a way to basically take advantage of what they're doing and, and where they're weak. So I don't know exactly how it shifted. The stuff I'm talking about is where it was before. Who knows? I, I do know that in my one draft today, though. I was able to wheel a couple of bows, so they still seem to let the bows go, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure about other stuff. Like, uh, can you still just force elementals and be okay? I don't really recommend forcing anything, though. Mm -hmm. The thing I would avoid, I've even had uh, luck with white, especially when I've paired it with blue. But basically, I think if you try to stay open for the first half pack, but then really settle into what the bots are telling you to be in. Uh, you just want to be in the open color, you know, and it, it's, yeah. still, it's, it's still, it's still about drafting. that. It's still yeah. drafting it is as for all its faults. Bot draft is logical enough that you can still read signals and find the open lane and stay there. I, I do have a question. I don't know if you can answer it, uh, but I've heard it asked a lot of times and I don't know the answer to it, which is that, do the bots draft decks? No, not as I design them, because that was not ever the point. Uh -huh. uh, when you get into game design, you have very, very limited time to accomplish the goals that you have for your systems and features. And mm -hmm. you do not have room to put in cute stuff or put in features that don't actually matter to the end experience. And I get that question a lot about like, how do the, what do the decks look like? What are, do the bots draft good decks? Are they playable? And of course they're going to be playable, but I would say that as I left them, the bots did not really care about, for example, CMC. There was no, mm. uh, bots were not aware of the curve of their deck and did not make decisions based on the curve of their deck. So, but curve tends to be part of the ranking of cards on it's, a power it's level. Of, it's kind of baked in. Right, like they don't take fire elementals because they're not very good and they're not very good because they're five drops and are su super easily replaceable. And therefore the bots don't take a bunch of too many five drops or whatever, right? Yeah, it is, it is sense. baked into the nature of good drafting that you end up with a curve based on how you prioritize the, in the vacuum power of a pick. And uh, I did have the tools to look at what the bots drafted, but I n mainly used that just to make sure that, they were doing what I expected, you know, that the programming was leading to the picks that the design suggests they should be making, or just to uh, see for my own curiosity when they would lock into pairs. Because basically, as I left them, the bots were looking to uh, take the best card in the pack <clears throat> until they had a density of cards in two colors such that they would choose to lock into that color pair. And then they would, uh, elevate in value everything in that color pair and artifacts such that in order to take something that wasn't in their color pair or an artifact, it would have to be a really good card. And that's how, mm -hmm. that's how they simulate, that's how the draft bots simulate splashing. If there is truly, you know, if they're red green and they're, even if it's a murder, you know, there might be uh no, I actually think they did it to, maybe they did it to color amount. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter though. That's the point. It's like, there's enough rules going on that they make, picks that are good enough for a solid draft experience. It's never going to be enough for purists. And I get that. And I never designed it for purists. My mm -hmm. goals when we worked on that system were primarily to create a clock free place for players new to draft. We needed a mm. place where 
someone who would be not used to all the cards and would be very intimidated by suddenly a one minute clock to read 14 or 15 cards and make a decision, right? Yeah. So we felt it was essential to provide those players with a place to onboard to limited, nice and easy. Take your time with each pick, learn what drafting is all about. That's what I designed it for. When I designed it, my expectation was that there was going to be a uh, bot-based kiddie pool and a human-based deep end. And instead, the deep end and the kiddie pool are both bot-based, which is not even ideal to me. But Mm -hmm. I do think maybe it gets a little heavier knock on it than it maybe deserves uh, it definitely deserves some knocks. I mean, I've said here, right here, like the uh, the lack of its ability to evolve, to change along with the metagame is a pretty deep flaw of bot-only drafting, but it can do a good work and serve its good purpose. And for me, at the end of the day, I still have a bunch of picks in front of me and I got to make the right one. And mm-hmm. then I got a bunch of cards in front of me and I got to make the right plays. If it's not exactly like what it would be as a human draft in terms of the deck I end up with, uh, that's okay by me for the improved experience overall of gameplay on Arena. Mm-hmm. So, But uh, I would continue as a community to want to put pressure on Wizards to get us uh, eight humans Human, drafting. Yeah, We all want it, it. So if I looked at the pool that a bot drafted, though, it would at least resemble something that a person, you know, that was trying to play two colors had actually drafted. Yeah. I think you could build a deck out of the bot drafts. You might mm-hmm. see some lack of synergy though. Uh, the, the toughest place to design bot logic is around cards like uh, the, the God, I, the more you get the better cards for example, the, the soldier, the, uh, yeah. the new yeah, conquistador. Yeah. And then the, the, the zombie that the three, two zombie. Yeah. It's pretty <clears throat> yeah. easy to tell the system uh, this card is about this good and then have them draft around that. But a card like the undead servants and the, uh, the soldiers are their how good they are changes based on what you have in your pile. And it's not really worth the dev investment to get the bots that good. That's where it's like as designers and engineers, I could have found people who would probably come in on the weekend with me and do it just because it's so fun to mess with AI and whatever, but it really mm-hmm. wasn't needed for the project. And you really need to focus on your project's needs, not what would be fun to do with the technology you're working on. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, when you were there, this was still uh, being developed, uh, you know, like under quite a time crunch and all that exactly. stuff too, I assume. Yeah. Priorities. Um, all right, uh, let, let's let's talk about arena. We've already uh, you know uh, touched on it pretty heavily here, but let's just get into it. First things first. I just wanted to get some updates from you before we get to our listener questions. Uh, okay. How's the free to play account going on your stream? Um, have you had to deposit any anything into that account yet? No, we're pretty good here. Let me. I'll bring it up. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, so my goal on my stream. I'm at uh, Twitch TV slash Going Optimal, and I stream uh, weekdays at 9 a.m. Pacific. And our first thing we do every day is we load up our free-to-play account, where the only thing we have done is spend $5 on the welcome bundle back in late November of last year. And with a a five-day-a-week stream, my personal goal is to draft every day on stream from the free-to-play account without spending any more money. And we fall off that pace sometimes. I will not play Sealed on the free-to-play account because it's a consumer of gems. So when Mm -hmm. Sealed is the only thing available, we switch to my paid account where we'll drop money, no problem. And we'll we'll waste gems on Sealed on that account. But basically every other time of the season, we are starting on the free-to-play account and we're we're doing it. We have, uh, we're drafting. I haven't put any more money into this account uh, since November. I win at about a 60% clip uh, it's a little different for best of one and best of three, but it averages out to about 61, 60, 61% win rate. And currently we have uh, 3,100 gold and 7,220 gems. So we have several drafts banked and, you know, we grind enough gold every four days for a free draft. Uh, but our bankroll has been so good. We've actually been playing in traditional, been playing in best of three, which is, you know, uh, that's awesome. Your goals, like, Look, if my goal is fully draft once a day, then the correct thing for me to do is actually only play in ranked, where the cost of entry is uh, 750 as opposed to uh, 1500 gems. But uh, ultimately, the uh, the 
payout for higher skilled players is better in best of three, such that we get a little advantage by playing best of three uh, because of the the tilted prize support. So it, it helps us to... So basically when I can, when I feel like our bankroll is strong enough, we play best of three. And, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm bringing poker style bankroll management mentalities to arena. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because, you know, Marshall, you know, like... The cost of an event is fifteen hundred, and we have seven thousand two hundred twenty gems. How's our bankroll? <laughs> not good. <laughs> it's not good. Like you know, most people would look at that and think you're great. You've got like four, three, four events. It's like, yeah. Have you ever gone o two and three straight magic events? <laughs> or, or you know, like the the risk of ruin yes. here is is almost inevitable. No matter how good you are, you're gonna hit a hit a run where you go three straight traditional drafts without cashing for gems. And if we do that, boom, suddenly we're in the gutter in terms of our bankroll. So it's funny. A lot of people think our bankroll looks huge for a free-to-play account, but I'm always nervous about it. I'm like, man, we are just one bad run away from bottoming out on this account. And if we do, then we switch back to the paid account and we just grind back gold back on the free-to-play. But I've been very, uh, very proud and happy that since November, we have only played, only paid five bucks and we've drafted effectively every day for free. And and again, you know, this is a big part of what Ryan does over at Going Optimal on his stream. I recommend it to people as kind of a companion to LR because Ryan brings the LR mentality uh, and attitude and all of that stuff to to uh, drafting on arena, right? And this is a, a way that a lot, in fact, I would say, you know, a, a big chunk of magic players now experience limited is on arena. And, uh, you know, if you're on a budget, if, if, you know, if you're looking at arena and going, that looks really fun, you guys, but I just can't sit here and start dumping money into this thing all the time just to try to keep playing. You know, if you follow along with what Ryan does, and of course, there's a lot of levers here, one of them being your win rate, right? So you do have to win at Ryan's clip, which is which is difficult to do. But, you know, you can win less than he does and, and still do the other grind stuff and still get a bunch of, of drafts on there. Yeah, we're and all boy, infinite. We're, yeah, we're, all yeah, infinite. we're all infinite at some point, right? It's just yeah. a matter of how often you're drafting, right? And so maybe yeah. if you don't have a 60% win rate, you're not drafting five times a week like I am, but you can get... I mean, you're going to draft twice a week, even if you're not winning at all, because you can grind out the gold for that. So it's really like your floor is basically like 1.75 drafts a week and win rate just starts to tick that up. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, uh, of course, Ryan can uh, teach you how to do that over there as well. Um, Big picture. Uh, You know, we haven't checked in on your thoughts on Arena in a little while. What do you think about the general direction of the program as it heads towards its official release? We're still in beta uh, technically speaking, obviously it's it's quite widely released, but you know there will be a, a shift I, I, in at least mentality, if not marketing, uh, when when the program goes into uh, its official release. Yeah, I think How it's headed in a, from your in a it solid good? direction. Uh, I get a little worried that a lot of their updates lead to performance issues. So as they add features and content, it taxes the system a little bit. So I hope they keep. Mm-hmm. Performance under control. Not everybody has a brand new mach- screen and machine, and I want everybody to be able to play this. But I think the most important needs for getting to uh, beta. I mean, they could they could go out of closed beta right. They could go out of beta right now if they wanted. It's a it's yeah. You know, I mean, they've been th- taking money and operating yeah, under. Full, they effectively whatever. are. This is classic yeah. classic post Google beta reality yep. in which yeah. <laughs> uh, in which beta means whatever you want it to mean, and for it, beta is. Don't hassle us yet. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Beta is leave us alone. We haven't said it's done yet, even though they're yep. totally making money and everything. So somewhat the beta tag is just an excuse anyway. So rather than like what needs to happen before leaving beta, I'd rather speak to just like what are the what would my priorities be if I were design director on the project? And um, I would be looking at round-based tournaments as a big effort that needs to happen because of coverage. I think as we've seen like Twitch rivals struggle to come up with a format that works on arena, um, you know, in order for it to really be a, uh, a viewing pleasure and a coverage monster, you know, in a good way, uh, they need to be able to have round based tournaments with, with, uh, 
which they just don't have, right? A Swiss Swiss no. pairing, you know? Yeah. And once they do that, then they can accommodate all sorts of tournaments that they have not been able to do so far. It's just that that's more on the competitive level. But I think they need, like, basically part of the question is what needs to happen to this program for it to consume Magic Online, right? Mm-hmm. And certainly the ability to better host competitive round-based tournaments is one of them. Uh, we've talked extensively about human drafts. I don't know if they consider it a need. Maybe they're just done. Maybe they're like, eh, bot drafts is good enough. We're making the money. Let's be done. I don't think they'll ever be done, but I don't have no idea where human drafts are on their priority list, but I just hope it's still on the radar. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would like to see them more elegantly solve the uh, the best of one, best of three ranking thing, which we'll get into in a little bit, I'm sure, uh, But but basically some work there. I want to see uh, real friend features. I think that's the other big thing. Mm. It's one thing, you know, Marshall, we, you and I could play right now. We mm-hmm. could. There's this whole convoluted challenge system where I could mm-hmm. track you down. and ch- It's just a too much of a my, pain, my though. string of numbers. And, yeah. and we, can't, we can't play 40-card decks, by the way. No, and we have to pre-coordinate. I have to, like, text you and say, hey, yes. do, you, do you want to play Arena right now? Okay, let us both go and log in and play Arena right now. Yep. What I want is I... Log in in the afternoon because it's what I'm doing. Uh, a friend list pops up and I see that you or Adam is online. And I say, I right click uh, or I click on you and chat. And I say, hey, I'm, I'd am i be up for some standard. You want to want to throw down? And then you say, sure. And then, and then we just have an immediate ability to just challenge each other. I would actually play with friends more if it weren't so convoluted to get paired up. I'm glad that they mm-hmm. have it at all. I mean, it allows... Uh, uh, people testing to really do real testing on arena, which is great, but for, yeah. and it does allow the loophole tournaments that have come up in the kind of early days. Like you said, the Twitch rivals and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just, Although not only do many I of want those have gone away from head to head too. I don't know if you've seen that, but yeah, cause like, they can't, cause you can't do it. Right? <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't work. So that, so they'll have them like draft a, you know, kind of do like a, a marathon, you know, where they're like, well, we draft against random people and then it's whoever can get like the best record over the course of three drafts or whatever. Yeah, that and that's, kind of uh, that's it's not des- what they want. It's not what they want, but they're doing what they have to do, which is designing within the constraints they have. And they, I think it's a fine design given the constraints of the system. But I, yeah, I think we need to prioritize releasing, you know, loosening those constraints and allowing the program to fly free. And real, uh, and not just looking, when I say friend features, I don't just want to see that you're online and be able to challenge you. There's so much you can do uh, with the stickiness of your player base with good friend systems. And I know that the team Mm. knows this. I expect a big update soon uh, that unveils a whole new set of uh, social features. I think uh, one of the things that I think is really sad about digital magic is both on Magic Online and now on Arena, how underutilized the value of a perfectly replayable and coded game is. How many... uh, I've had something about streaming where when I play off air, I naturally have the most epic, incredible games you've ever seen. Right. Mm -hmm, Of course. This is all just code. It's all just a sequence of things that happened in a magic game. There is, it's so simple to be able to take a, uh, a a magic game that has occurred on arena and replay it. So why don't Mm -hmm. I have a share game tool that just allows me to uh, uh, share an amazing game on the internet and allow you to watch it, uh, inside your arena app, you know, or, uh, mm-hmm. deck sharing the same way. The, I think the most, one of the most awkward parts of arena right now, and I'm really kind of a little annoyed about this because it was in my, des- it was very specific in my design doc, uh, that if you're going to do exporting and importing, you need to be able to import decks from a text file that uses the classic number space card name format. Yes. Yes, it's utterly not, ridiculous. Not number space dash <laughs> symbols or whatever. Or, or more, yeah, more importantly, like right now to import into Magic Arena, you need to know the set code and some random arbitrary number associated with the card to be able to import it. It's ridiculous. Nobody can just import uh, cards into a, a deck into Arena. You have to know what the... Th- anyway, that, that's a, a pet peeve of mine because I thought it was very important for the feature and it didn't get didn't get done. So I'd really like to see them... Uh, improve importing and deck sharing as well. I also want to be able to go on the internet and say, this deck is sweet. You should try it. And there's a link and you click it and uh, it imports that deck 
directly into arena for you. No problem. Yeah. You and know. there it is. Yeah. So those are some, uh, those are some features I would like to see from arena before it's, uh, ready for the world, ready for the loss of the beta tag, I suppose, or All ready right. for them to say it's done. Yeah. I know a lot of our listeners are hoping for the human drafts to happen. That is a, a big priority for us limited players. Um, before we get into, uh, the listener questions, one last uh, question is, uh, have they made any changes recently, um, that are relevant to you, us, right. Uh, you know, the kind of the Ryan LR style archetype of player, the, the, the person who pr primarily plays limited, maybe dabbles a bit in constructed is looking for some value and is looking to draft as often as possible. Have they been tweaking anything with that? Well, there's the mastery pass, which we can talk about, but yeah, I got, we got a bunch of questions about that. Okay. So we'll wait until we get to those listener questions mm -hmm. to touch, touch on mastery pass, but that's one of the things Really, the biggest thing they've done since the beginning of the year remains the ability to convert wild cards into gems for the limited player via drafting. Mm -hmm. It's a very narrow window of player, a na narrow spectrum of player that is that that can can use this. Um, if you are someone who does not care about constructed at all, if a hundred percent of your play on arena is going to be limited based, then you can exit a draft. Go to your uh, collection and craft up to four copies of a rare or a mythic that you are about to draft. Go back into the draft, draft it, and get gems at the end of the pack for having mm -hmm. uh, drafted a fifth copy of a rare or a mythic. That is, the, again, I'm going to repeat, this is only for limited-only players. If you care about Constructed at all, just use your wild cards on cards you care about for Constructed. But if you are totally in Arena to draft as much as you can, like we are on my free-to-play account, then you should look for opportunities to, especially on Mythics, where it's going to be tough for you to get 4X of them. Let's say you happen to get two copies of Mythic Chandra, and you're about to draft a third. You leave the draft, go draft, go craft up two copies of Mythic Chandra, come back, draft the fifth, and then boom, you get 40 extra gems. Yep, it's which not can huge. translate into drafts down the line over right. time. It's, it's just a little piece. You know, it's 750 gems just to get a rank draft. So it's not like 40 changes your world or anything. But if you truly have no other use for wild cards, it is the thing to do with them as a limited player. And it's just something that didn't exist until they made that economic change. So that remains kind of the biggest tool for the limited only player to get a little extra value out of the system. But uh, beyond that, it's been little updates to the bots and kind of the mastery pass as a new value puzzle to assess, which we can get to when there's a listener question about it. Okay, let's get into these questions. Uh, we've got oh, half an hour. Hey, Rocket. Um, hey, Rocket. He's excited. He's, home. Rocket's always excited to come on the podcast. Um, so let's uh, let's try to cruise through as many of these as we can get. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. We never really, really do. But uh, let's see what we can Pick do your here. Faves. Yeah, so the the first one is let's just get that out of the way. Um, Seth wants to know. Uh, he says, uh, "Can you give me a rundown on the new mastery system and whether primarily limited players should care about it?" Uh, sure. So the mastery system is a new way to, that they're trying to engage players, both to increase their daily play, uh, you know, the amount that people are playing, and also to get people to make a purchase. One of the big goals for video game companies on a uh, game as service model like arena is which is to say ongoing downloadable downloadable content to till the end of time uh they need to uh they, they really want to get people to bust out their credit cards for the first time and just make that first purchase and get used to the idea of spending money on your game so they do a lot of appealing one-time purchases to try to increase engagement and increase conversion which is to say get you to buy so that's the mastery pass and what it is is an experience system so by completing quests and winning games, you get experience and you can basically get experience for one level a day and across the experience is format based. So a mastery pass right now is for M20 only. It's the M20 mastery pass. And at the end of the M20 season, as soon as the new set shows up, the M20 mastery pass will go away and the mastery pass for the new set will show up. So it'll be another opportunity to purchase it. And what it is is basically a 3,400 gem purchase that unlocks a track of goodies. So you get to, mm -hmm. as you level up, oh, I got a booster pack. Oh, I got a little gold. Oh, I got some gems. Oh, I got this cool 
uh, avatar. I got some uh, treatments for my, you know, styles for my cards. All some mm-hmm. of it's cosmetic, right? It's not even impactful of the game. And basically, uh, they try to set it's, it's classic. It's like it's like gift cards. You know why? Why are they willing to take give you a hundred dollar gift card for a hundred dollars? Because I mean, the gift card costs them something. This all costs them something. Well, they're counting mm-hmm. on some number of people not redeeming their gift card and thus paying for the cost of doing that thing, right? And so Mastery Pass has a little bit of that to it, where it's like, oh, you can buy this thing, and then over time, if you do it all, you extract enough value to make it worth it. So it's kind of funny, because you put in 3,400 in gems, and then you take back out little bits and drips and drabs over the course of the season. So the big question is, at what level am I likely to make it to? And what are the rewards for that level? That's the fundamental question. And one of the great things about the Mastery Pass is you don't have to buy now and find out. You can find out and then buy, which is to say, uh, so for example, on my free-to-play account, because my bankroll, you know, as we said, 7,000 is not a huge bankroll for a $1,500 entry. I'm not willing to commit 3,400 gems to a Mastery Pass on free-to-play when my bankroll is so tight, especially because... When I, if I do finally commit to it, I get everything I earned up to that point immediately. So if right okay. now I'm at level 50 or so on uh, Arena, if I were to buy the Mastery Pass today, I'd get all the rewards up through level 50. So first and foremost, there's no real economic penalty for waiting. There's some patience penalties. Uh, you don't get the things straight away. Yeah, you don't get the things straight away. And you can make an argument that because some of the boost, some some rewards are boosters that you might want to be filling up your 4X fat, but whatever, it's very minor. I think it's, a, it's, it's accurate enough as a general statement to say that there is no economic, no significant economic penalty for just waiting until you're sure you're getting the value you want out of the mastery pass before buying it. And in fact, mm-hmm. I'm going to throw you a link, Marshall, that you can share with the listeners it is a uh, uh, one of my regular viewers, uh, Raptor, not that Raptor, um, different Raptor, <laughs> has made mm-hmm. a, a a table where you can plug in what you. Because another big question about the Mastery Pass is, Marshall, what is a booster pack worth to you in gems on Arena? Right, that's right? the question. And, and for some people, answer. it's one thing, and for other people, it's another thing. For me, on a free to play limited account, a booster is worth. 20 gems because that's what I'm likely to get out of it after I forex my account, right? It's mm-hmm. just worth 20 gems to me. So for me, so th- using this table, I can say that a booster is worth 20 gems to me. If you're a constructed player and you'd happily pay 200 gems for a pack, or I don't even know what, like whatever you'd happily pay for a, in gems for a pack, you can plug that number in. And so basically this spreadsheet allows you to plug in how much you value in gems, the non-gold and gem items in the mastery pass, plug in what level you expect to hit, and it will tell you how many gems worth of value you're getting out of it. And you can see whether it's worth 3,400 to you or not. So that's a really useful tool. And uh, the tricky part is understanding for, for yourself what these things are worth to you. Because some of them are not game, like like you said, some of them are styles or avatars and stuff that they may have zero value to you. Yeah, to me, have... it's absolutely, it's 100% zero gems. On all of the cosmetic stuff, I put zero. But frankly, if you would pay 50 buck, fifty gems to have all these, whatever, you can plug that in and have it be part of your equation, you know? So it's a yeah. nice okay. customizable tool. And in terms of, so the other big fear people have is, so level 100 is the maximum. Am I ever going to be able to get to level 100? Like, how do I even know? So again, first, you can wait, mm-hmm. see if you get there. But mm-hmm. the things that drive experience, there's four things. There's uh, winning 15 times a week. All right. You win 15 times a week. You've maxed out that XP. So like if, two matches a day, roughly? Yeah. Right. Okay. Win, win two matches a day. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and that's on average. You can do it all on Saturday if you want or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then uh, complete all your quests. If you complete all your quests, you're maxing out the quest angle because you get 500 XP for every completed quest and 1,000 XP update is up a level, right? So every two quests, you get a level up. And then uh, bonus codes, they're going to have these uh, redeemable codes. You go to the store tab in your client and enter in the special code, and you'll get 1,000 XP. There's a couple of those codes out there. I think it is uh, level up, all one word, and brought back, all one word. Mm -hmm. If you enter those into the store code thing, you'll get 1,000 XP each. 
And then they've also promised that there's going to be some number of events that appear to be free. Like, you know, you can see you can earn these uh, John Avon Unhinged Lands, my my favorite basics, by the way. Um, uh, if you play in this uh, treasure event right now, anyway, they're, they're rolling out these weekly events that if you win once in, you get a thousand XP, right? So there's, so that's the, those are the four, basically special mm -hmm. events, store codes, quests, and winning 15 times a week. And if you do all of those things to the max, you're going to end up with the equivalent of 109, level 109. You basically have nine levels to give in terms of, oh, I missed a quest this week or I, you know, whatever. So uh, if you're going to miss 18 quests, well, you can still make it to level 100 because that, you know, that's going to be 500 each and that costs you your 9,000, you'll still be at 100. Their point is that with, uh, with all of this free access to uh, XP, I fully believe that most players are going to find enough value in the mastery pass to, to make it worth getting. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those of you who aren't sure, just wait until you're wait until it's built up such that you are sure. And you just set, your deadline is the release of the next set. Uh, you can buy the mastery pass for M20 a half hour before the new set goes on sale and you'll get everything from that pass. So if you're worried about it, wait. But if you're someone who tends to complete all of your quests and tends to win 15 times a week, all you have to do is keep your ear to the ground for codes and special events and you'll get the 100 levels, no problem. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like it's very personal, right? Like yeah. each person's going to have their own answer to that. Where they, if if you love the 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 shiny stuff you know we call them sparkle ponies right mm -hmm. if, if you like that kind of stuff on the game then it's probably a slam dunk if you're doing it for straight up value then you're going to have to take a look at, at how much you value these things at and, and how high you get yeah and if uh, you have a decent budget for magic and you really just like little gifts just do it because it's fun to get extra stuff when you win you know it's a it's mm -hmm. like it's like uh, buying yourself presents that arrive in a in a few weeks or whatever so yeah. I, I think it's uh, a good system. And and certainly here's the other thing I said about it is kind of prescient. I, I wrote an article for CFB on the mastery pass. And in it, I said, uh, but I, you know, bottom line, I believe that Wizards has invested so much into this system and into this rollout that I truly believe they're going to make whatever changes they have to make so that their enfranchised players will be happy with this purchase. And I, I finished on that. And there was a bunch of outrage about some aspects of it. The very next day, they made a bunch of changes to address the outrage. You know, so yeah, it's like yeah. they, are, they are committed to making this thing an appealing aspect of arena. So, yeah, uh, why, why is this what they're working on? But is this just money? Yeah, just it's money it, it's engagement. It's really an engagement okay. thing. And in fact, oh, okay, if see. you look at what people complained about, the thing, the way the system was working before they made this change was that you had to win uh multiple times like you had to play each day like basically it wasn't win 15 times a week it was win your first three times today i think it was like a little bit of xp some you know double xp for first win and then half xp for your next two or something like that but it was daily and people were really mad that in order to max out their xp wizards was saying you have to come in here and play every day and the reason they did that is because that's that's actually just part of their goals. Part of the engagement goals of any video game like this is to mm -hmm. uh, get your players into a daily habit, you know, get into get, get mm -hmm. them into a daily pattern of play. It's a very important goal to for the longevity of your uh, video game as a service. And so it's not surprising at all that they tried that. But it's also not surprising that that was the point of backlash from the community saying, I won't buy it because of this. And then immediately when people were not buying it because of that, they changed it. They changed it back to weekly and uh, mostly the community seems pretty happy with it now. Yeah. I just, I, I just remember seeing it and being like, you know, there seems to be like legitimate functionality that's currently not in on this program, right? Like there's things like people want to be able to play at other places than just on a windows PC. There's the, oh, yeah, you know, I for didn't us, mention that. there's the, yeah, there's the eight person draft thing for us, uh, you know, with human beings. Um, there's, you mentioned the friend function. I, I can't even just say hi to a friend on there, right? Like that's weird. Um, you know, these are things that I think most people assume will be built into it at some point. And then they're like the mastery, you know, it's like, what? Like I can sign up for some kind of convoluted 
I get some extra bonuses, but I had to pay money for them. And I have to do some weird calculation to decide if that's even worth it to me thing. You know, I, I, it feels like a little bit like they're just going for a, you know, like a money grab or something like that. Now yeah, it's all a money I, grab, I, right? I mean, it is, it uh, is, but it's just, it, it, the thing is, is that since we like for me, I don't have any uh, visibility into what's been working on when like this could have been this could have been a piece of functionality that they've had in the pipe for four months. Right. Like they consider this core functionality for the app or something like that. I don't know. It's just in my mind. And of course, I'm one person and then each person has their own set of priorities. I have a set of priorities in my head where I'm like, well, isn't priority X that I value much higher than whatever this mastery thing is more important. And shouldn't the dev work and everything be going to that mm -hmm. rather than this, you know, again, it's like, this isn't, th th this is good for wizards and has some upside for players, but it's not adding core functionality, right. To the, mm -hmm. to the thing. And, and again, I mean, I'm recognizing my own bias here by saying that I'm, a, I'm applying that to the list of things that I think are important <laughs> for me. Right. right. Not not that I would do if I worked at Wizards, because I may do the same thing that they did. It's just it's just like I don't I, you know, the, to me, I'm just look at this and I'm going, OK, this is kind of cool. But like, can I play this on my Mac yet? Or can I play this on an iPad or you know what I mean? Like right. rather than like, oh, I get more more chances to give you money for sparkly things that that I'm not, you know, at least a player like me isn't super. Ultimately, if you about. were in the director's chair, you would be tasked with shareholder value, right? Wizards exactly. of the Coast is owned by Hasbro. Hasbro is a publicly traded company, and there are huge shareholder expectations. Your job is to ultimately increase shareholder value through happiness in the magic community, right? And mm -hmm. so fundamentally, yeah, it's about, uh, you can call it a cash grab or whatever you want, but it is about maximizing profit. But But having been on the inside, I can tell you that the people there most mostly who are wanting to maximize profit are truly wanting to do it through making you the magic player thrilled like that yep. is the goal is not to that sneakily is. extract dollars from your wallet while they're cackling on the way to the bank it is to make you so damn happy with this game that you can't throw the money at them fast enough right that, yeah. that that's really the goal it's not to be evilly capitalistic but like capitalism through gaming pleasure is truly the goal and, yeah, uh, and, and it is interesting because, you know, you and I, you having worked there and me having worked uh, closely with Wizards for a long time now, have a much different perspective, I think, than the the average Magic fan that, that kind of follows this stuff, uh, you know, on the Internet and, you know, on social media and stuff like that, where it's much easier to group Wizards of the Coast as like this one entity. But you realize very quickly that like every other company, that's not actually how it works there. Um these are individual people making individual decisions and they're uh they're you know they have mandates obviously but like when you actually talk to those people and see the decisions that they made and why they made them you do realize very quickly that these are people that that really do care about these products uh and and about the the consumers as well but it's i just, think that, you know, yeah you know, the justification flow. of the value here is that uh from from that from that perspective that i just gave it's that look Let's really increase our retention. Let's increase our conversion. Let's get our percentage of, of downloads that become payers up. Let's show corporate that, you know, we've done that, that our, our, our player base is expanding and everybody's buying this mastery pass. We've increased engagement. All right. We've, uh, our, these numbers, our baseline numbers are much better now. Now we have a better foundation on which to argue for all of these, uh, fancier features that that everybody wants because we have we have the money rolling in you know? i know that's the part that that i actually you know I, look wizards of the coast is a is a successful company and you know i don't i don't feel good or bad for them they just they do the things that they do right but this is the one time when i really look at this and i've seen this uh you know multiple times from my other roles and stuff is is the the idea that if you're an employee at a big company, you're kind of looking in two directions. You're looking up and you're looking down, right? You're looking up to your bosses who have needs, wants, desires, things that you need to to do, to show, to fulfill. And then you're looking down at the people who you're giving this stuff to, right? You're, you know, you're, you're looking at this at, at the customers and you're saying, hey, you know, we want to make you happy too. So if I come up and say, this is the thing that I want, and they say, we would love to give that to you, 
but my boss won't let me unless I show them that this is going to be long-term viable moneymaker or whatever, right? That they can justify putting in the money and effort that they need to do in order to make this feature that I want that isn't necessarily a big money-making feature. It's just one that makes me happier. Yeah. Right. And, and, and this is the thing that, that is just really hard to grasp. Like you said, th this thing, this mastery thing could be easily that, right? It could be the situation where they are now doing a proof of concept of saying, look, we can roll out engagement and selling sparkle ponies and, you know, all of these extra things that this type of, uh, software adds right to it to our program and then they get the green light to put it on the things that you know to get the eight person drafts which the higher ups might look at that and go well do we anticipate making a lot more money if we right. do eight person drafts How does the revenue because all of this gets modeled mm -hmm. right if you go and say right. we should make eight person drafts okay we'll model that how does that change what, what is our expected right. return on investment there how long is it going to cost take to a do lot. that? Yeah, we're going to yeah. put this amount of development time and it's going to increase our retention slash download slash whatever by how much, right? And the answer is not mm -hmm. zero, right? It would it would absolutely yes. increase, but the development costs aren't zero either. And no, and, so and the question is, how does that compare to the other things that they could be doing? Exactly. It, it's It's not in a vacuum. It's not... Okay, well, then we'll do that. It's that they have to rank that against other stuff. Okay, um, questions from listeners. Nathan says, probably already answered somewhere, but is there more value in the best of three unranked draft or the best of one ranked draft when taking into account the end of season rewards? End of season rewards, uh, there's no difference. Like, uh, well, there is, I mean, okay, you should play some amount of ranked at least to generate gold. Like I try to get my rank to gold, but beyond that, rank doesn't really matter. Uh, and in terms okay. of value of uh, best of one versus best of three, that I, I can uh, so I track all of my results on going optimal on a spreadsheet. And also in that spreadsheet is an EV calculator for events, which I'll share with Marshall and you can put in the show notes. But basically, uh, you can uh, make a copy of the spreadsheet, punch in your win rate and take a look at the different expected value for the different queues. And where the value is depends on a couple of things. It depends on your win rate. It depends on how much you value uh, singles. Like, do you do you value boosters at all for constructed? And um, and do you value? Do you, are you looking at it in terms of cost per event or cost per game? Like, if I'm trying to do it, for example, my desire to play in one event per day could lead me to just only play in ranked because it's the cheapest entry cost. All of them are negative EV. If you couldn't grind gold, I would run out, I would be out of resources by now. I'm not infinite right. on uh, arena, except for the fact that we can all grind gold. So. Which is why you said we're all infinite. Yeah. We're right? all infinite. Cause, cause mm -hmm. all of us can, can play whatever and earn some gold to get back into an event. Uh, so if you're into it for, I just like I, I just want to draft once a day. Well, then you might want to stick with rank. But if you're all about, if you're kind of what, about what I am, which is what is my cost per game of limited magic? Like mm -hmm. if, if it's fundamentally a cost per game level, it actually gets pretty close at my win rate between best of one and best of three. And it's kind of broken by the fact that uh, the tie is broken by the fact that in best of three, uh, as you win more, you get extra boosters. So like the most you, most boosters you can win in best of one is two. But if you go, you know, if you get five wins or uh, in best of three, I think you get six boosters, five or six boosters. And yeah, as you're six. Yeah. yeah. And as you're looking to four X your rares and mythics so that you can start to get gems from opening packs that that actually starts to build up. And so having an extra few packs per win is effectively for a limited player expecting to four X uh, 20 to 40 gems per pack uh, for for your trouble. So those are the factors involved to truly understand what the best value for you is. You need to understand first, what scoreboard are you looking at? What what is winning to you? Is it uh, games per gem or gems per game or is it gems per event or g events per day? So, you know, what are your goalposts and then what's your win rate? And then you and how do you value boosters? You, and you can use the spreadsheet to answer all those three questions and come up with a custom answer for yourself because ultimately, unfortunately, it's all so close that it's going to be pretty individual. But the good news is if you don't want to do that work, 
you can play best of one, best of three, and know that your cost per game is going to be roughly in the ballpark that you don't need to worry about it too much. Okay. Um, Nathan says, do you think they'll ever make best of three drafting ranked? Oh, boy. Get out the soapbox. Uh Uh-oh. I'll try to keep this a little short, but basically, uh, I hope so. But I understand, you know, Wizards is being pulled in a lot of directions in terms of their design goals on this one. To me, best of three is the most competitive way to play limited and therefore ought to be ranked. But and a lot of people don't understand why it wouldn't be. And I'm going to at least lay out for you some of the goals and considerations Wizards likely has to on their uh, limited play and you try to design a system that accounts for all of these requirements okay so first requirement you want to promote and support best of one play as authentic competitive magic and kind of like the authentic competitive magic for arena they really want to lean into best of one as the main way to play on magic arena so that's goal number one Goal number two, uh, provide a 24-7 gem entry draft draft queue of the latest set, right? So the latest set comes out. uh, They need to have a gem entry queue available all the time. Uh, They want to tightly control and limit the availability of gold entry draft queues of the latest set. And we've seen that now. They've now agreed that uh, once they make it available, they're going to keep it available the whole time. Mm -hmm. But there's this gap between um, when the set launches and when you can draft that set for gold. And they want to keep that gap because that gap forces people to spend gems if they want to play limited of the new set. And that's a big way to get people to spend their gems and spend money. So that's uh, that's almost not negotiable. They're going to have that built in. Uh, They want to uh, provide a 24 seven best of three draft queue of the latest set. So that's important. Um, Regardless of whether it's the latest set. They need to provide a 24-7 best of one draft experience that takes gold for entry and pays out gems, even at zero wins. That's a weird one. I want to say that again. Legally, they are saying they're a free-to-play game. Some things require gems to to play. So you cannot legally say you're a free-to-play game unless there's also a free-to-acquire way to get gems because if something is gated by gems how do i get gems if i'm a free-to-play player and if i can't then your game is not free to play and you're a liar right Mm -hmm. so by having a queue where you can enter with gold lose all of your games and still get 50 gems that's how they legally are a free-to-play game because i could play basically with enough time everything in the system would be available to me without me ever having won a game I would just lose as I complete my daily quests until I have enough gold to lose my way through a ranked draft and I come out with 50 gems, having never won a game. Mm -hmm. Repeat until I have seven, you know, whatever gems. 750, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now now everything's technically unlocked. Legally, technically correct, the best kind of legally correct. uh, (laughs) Yeah, it uh, is that. (laughs) Is that that it's free to play, right? So they have to do that. Um, uh, They want a... And because... They are promoting rank as important. They also need to provide a 24-7 way for you to impact your limited rank with a gold entry. It would be unfair for for them to say, uh, you have to play this way. Uh, You have to spend gems to increase your rank at limited. So they need rank to be in uh, best of one for sure. Uh, They care about rank, let's say... um, they want to offer, let's see, there's just a lot of things, right? See all these factors that are piling up? Yeah, dude, this is a nightmare. It's a nightmare of re- requirements. And they want to, and then uh, elegance and consistency, consistency in game design. So, for example, uh, they want rank. Ranked formats have match have rank in the matchmaking, right? So they have this, they have a clear system that says, if this event impacts rank, then we will use rank on some level to match make in this queue. And that's something they want to be true throughout. So, Mm -hmm. uh, but they also want, because we've asked for it and I want it, I want a place where rank is not used to make limited matchmaking decisions. I want it to be record only, right? I don't Mm -hmm. care how good you are, how I am. You're 2-0, I'm 2-0, let's battle, right? Right. And so if we all want that, and I do, well... If they're not going to have rank impact matchmaking, then they can't have the event be ranked. 
or else it's inconsistent with everything else in the game where the presence of rank in the impact means the presence of rank in the matchmaking. And it may seem small to some people, but those inconsistencies can really wear away at a game and your ability to wrap your head around it. Whereas if you have nice, consistent rules and expectations, then you can see something new and understand it because it follows all the rules that they've established. And I, I think I'm close enough to the end of the list of reasons to kind of wrap this up, but you can see that just like when you have all these requirements, uh, you want a place for people to play with no rank and have the, you just, you run out of places to put everything. Yeah. And as much as I would like to get rank from my best of three drafting, really the most important thing to me is that I can be draft best two of three without being match made based on rank and have it be authentic. You know, like that's the number one thing. And so I'm fine with actually where they're at now because I don't care about rank that much, but it's a little weird. I, it, my recommendation yeah. to Wizards, if I was still there, would be to just say, look, your new clean message to everybody is all limited is ranked and impacts rank. But in this one case, there's an ex we don't match make on rank over here or something, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I but it's really kind of weird to launch a new set, say that they care about rank. They want us to care about rank, but we can't impact rank while playing in the new set. That just doesn't make sense to me. So despite my awareness of all the crazy requirements that this feature has on the designers working on it, I still think it's in the wrong place and they need to find some way to get rank into best of three limited. It just doesn't make sense to me that on day one of a new set, I'm not impacting my rank. So yeah, because we'll one of the because one of the uh, core tenets of the game too was that they wanted it to be authentic to magic, authentic magic, mm -hmm. and that does seem to be you know if you if you pulled players, hey, you know what format should we use for ranked? I think that most people would say uh, best of three. Yeah, the other thing just, they uh, could do that they haven't done yet is just make a, a gem only best of one queue at the at the launch. But again, there's the design inconsistency again. They want all ranked. They want all best of one draft cues to look and behave the same so to make one mm -hmm. that uh did not have a, a gold entry would be again a design inconsistency that you'd like to avoid but that is an answer to just say for uh a blatant cash grab <laughs> for the first yeah. n weeks uh this best of one queue is uh uh gem only still doesn't solve my d desire which is to have ranked best of three but there you go Right. Well, uh, we have uh, kind of burned through. <laughs> <laughs> we got one question in. <laughs> yeah, we got one. Uh, I, I guess I, I'll, I'll end with one uh, other question that uh, you can just give your take on from sure. Jace Kim, who says, I'd like to hear some discussion on the add-ons for the MTG arena, like MTG.GG overlay. I noticed that it gives you real-time statistics for potential land drops, remaining cards in your decks, and et cetera. Um, would you consider this to be an unfair advantage as it alleviates cognitive load for a player? For example, I won a game because I named a proper color with my Diamond Knight in the late game because I could quickly look up the spells I had remaining in my deck. And, you know, this is actually relevant, um, Ryan, because this uses uh, the uh, the numbers that Luis uses on his written set reviews for CFB. And it'll show you in the draft, it'll just put an overlay of, of what Luis uh gave each of those cards just straight away. Yeah, I actually installed that and used it for a, about for like half of a draft. And then I turned I at least turned off the uh, Luis overlay because it was distracting me. I didn't I almost didn't like it starts to make you just it's kind of the same reason I don't like grading uh, cards because it just kind of drags your focus to that. And suddenly I was uh, just kind of f looking at what Luis was rating things instead of thinking for myself, but it's a great mm -hmm. tool. If you're, you know, if you're getting going and, and want that reference point, it's excellent. Just don't, uh, don't blindly pick whatever the highest number is without thinking about context. Uh, so anyway, I, I do really, you, I, I do, do you think they're unfair. No, I think they're part of the game. I think uh, it's unfortunate that not every player knows about them and that they exist. So, but hopefully there's enough, community chatter about such things that you can find them. So uh, the one I use actually is a uh, MTGA tracker and MTGA tracker shows me uh, what's left in my deck. It shows me uh, 
while I'm drafting, it shows me what's in my collection. So I know if I have 4X of something, it doesn't show me Luis's ratings or whatever, but like I said, I don't, I don't particularly want that overlay personally anyway. Um, but uh, there are definite tools out there and I don't think it, they're quote unfair. I just think it's, they're quote unfortunate because some people know about them and some people don't, but I think every, yeah. I think you should install it. Like whether it's the, the, the Luis one that you're talking about or MTGA tracker or some other one, they're definitely worth uh, loading and, and using because they give you really useful information about uh, uh, in particular, just what's left in your deck. I think that's the most important tool that they provide is you being able to, uh, I can't tell you the number of times I have planned you know, what's my plan here? Uh, one, one of my things on stream is when I find myself waiting to die, you know, you get into that deject, like I said, you know, the, yeah. the, the blue deck plays a two, five, your white aggro, and then they play divination and you feel like you're done. Um, as soon as mm -hmm. I get that feeling, I use that as a trigger to remind myself it's time to ask what the plan is. Okay. If you're waiting to die, yep. either come up with your plan or scoop. OK, <laughs> like scoop yeah. and get on with your life or figure out how you have a path to victory and being able to look at what's left in your deck is very helpful to crafting those plans to victory. I had a great oh, like I said, I wish I could share games because I had this off stream game where I was at 14 life facing three unopposed flyers. I had <laughs> uh, one. Rabid Bite and one Deal 5 Exile and three bows in my deck somewhere. And mm -hmm. my opponent plays the 7-7 seven, seven Flyers. Life are, <laughs> yeah, 7-7 seven, seven Lifelink, your Flyers are indestructible. And I mm -hmm. had a Sleep Paralysis. So I was like, well, <laughs> I can paralyze <laughs> the freaking 7-7, seven, seven, but then I've got three small indestructible flyers bearing down on me. And but, all your removal is damage based. <laughs> and all of my removal is damage based. But then I drew yeah. my uh, weaponsmith and I came up with a plan. I was like, okay, I can either draw Rabid Bite or, uh, well, first I need to draw my deal five. But then mm -hmm. along with the deal five, I can either Rabid Bite or get some bows, ping the angel with bows finish it off with the five then the other flyers become destructible again and then mm -hmm. i can use the bows on them anyway i crafted a whole plan it worked I, wow. I i actually drew the deal five uh, shortly after getting two bows i attacked uh sent the two bow damage at this locked down angel but killed it and then used the bows to kill off everything else and won that game it was amazing wow but I was, that's incredible i was only able to craft that plan because i was able to look at what's left in my deck and say okay what even combines at all here to get this done and then found the path mm -hmm. so i definitely recommend uh getting a an app to do that Okay. Well, good stuff. Unfortunately, we'll have to cut it short here, Rye, uh, because I know you got to get going. Yeah, I got to um, take my kids to driving lessons. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. <laughs> uh, so we'll stop there. But I think next time you come on, um, let's plan on just opening the show up for uh, Listener Arena uh, questions so that we can dedicate just the entire show to that. Sure. We keep doing um, that. I think we, that that would be sweet. Yeah. We could, yeah. Uh, I, we can always talk for four hours if we if nobody stops us. So, yeah, exactly. And uh, I want to make sure that the listeners' questions get answered uh, for the next time around. So we'll do that. Uh, so that's going to do it for this one. Uh, first things first, you can find everything uh, related to the podcast on lrcast.com. I want to re uh, remind you our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. Check out uh, for GP Vegas. Uh, you're going to want to be there if you have any chance to to make it at all. Uh, and if you're not, there's going to be coverage. So you get to, to ride along and watch coverage of the GPs uh, either way. So pl please do uh, check that out. And remember, if you do put it in an order and you're going to the GP, you can get it. Ryan, where can people uh, find you and your stream and all that? Well, my stream is at uh, Twitch TV slash Going Optimal. So you want to catch me there at uh, 9 a.m. Monday through Friday Pacific. And you can find me on Twitter at Ryan Spain. I also have at Going Optimal, but my main presence on Twitter is at Ryan Spain. That's the best way to find me. And uh, I hope to catch you on my stream. I'll, you can check out my, I have a YouTube channel as well for, if you can't, yeah. catch, can't catch me live, you can find my uh, YouTube channel and I'll give you that link as well, Marshall, and you can catch my, catch my replays. Yeah. And it's not just replays, uh, Ryan, you'll also sometimes put in uh, little bits of content, right? Little, 
you know, if you if you talk about game design or or arena or whatever, you'll clip that out and put that in there too. And I think that's great. It's just a a nice little uh, way to kind of get your fix on a bunch of different types of uh, yeah. For example, of, today of I content. I went on at length telling the origin story of limited resources, and I'm certain yeah. to clip that into a separate video. So if you want to hear the origin story of LR, you can check my YouTube channel out and that'll be up tomorrow, I'm sure. There you go. And I'll have uh, links in the show notes for Ryan's stream, Twitter and YouTube channels as well. So if you want to uh, find those, I mean, they come with the highest LR recommendation. They're basically uh, stuff that we would be doing on the show uh, if we had the bandwidth, <laughs> you know, so uh, it's a perfect companion to LR. If you're learning, if you're trying on that uh, constant quest for improvement, like so many of us are, uh, this is another great way to uh, to aid you in that quest. Ryan, thanks a lot for coming along. We uh, look forward to seeing you next time. You got it. All right, that's going to do it for this one. We'll see you next week. It's not over yet, though, Marshall. We have a thing <laughs> wait, called a sign-off. <laughs> All right. What are you going to do? Are you going to well, sing or something? Or well, no. This more, as I just mentioned, this morning I told the story of the origin of LR on my stream, and mm -hmm. LR basically originated uh, while I was working at a place called Surreal Surreal Software on mm -hmm. a game called mm -hmm. This Is Vegas, and I thought I'd give a little side story on This Is Vegas because it's actually kind of an infamous, unfortunately, game in the game industry because it's one of the most expensive unshipped games of all time. <laughs> cost about uh estimates are in the 45 to 55 million range i think and it never shipped oh god uh, and we had a team of over 100 people working on it, it was a it was a game for it was going to be for the xbox 360 and other similar platforms of the day and uh, i was oh. hired as the gambling designer so i did some of my favorite design work in my career on that game and nobody ever got to see it. It was really sad. Like I had I had some people tell me on the team that they thought the stuff I worked on was the only shippable, <laughs> the only stuff that was shippable <laughs> in the entire game, which was a nice compliment. Uh, one of the hardest working guys on that project and really a, a tech a design tech genius is uh, Jay Parker, who's now design lead on Arena. So he's doing great work over on Arena, by the way. But he was part of this debacle as well. There was basically a debacle of technology mismatch. We basically got asked to make a an open world GTA GTA style game in a corridor shooter engine. Which, if anybody who makes games out there <laughs> knows, that's kind of a tall ask. The technology was not made for that kind of game. But back to the designs I really liked. I wanted to share with uh, some of my favorite game designs. So in this game, GTA style. You could make money doing different things. You could make money by getting into fights and getting some loot. You could make money by winning car races. You could even go to clubs and make money winning like dance contests. There were all these different Vegasy things you could oh, do. Oh, dude, I totally remember the dance contest right? demo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it was all. It was all pretty fun. And I, I uh, sorry, the game didn't see light of day. There was a lot of great stuff going on there. Uh, but anyway. One of the big problems with the gambling side of town is that we had all these pillars of gameplay that we wanted to be profitable, but we wanted the gambling to be authentic. So you have these three other areas, fighting, racing, and, and partying, where you could make money, and then this authentic gambling where you could lose money. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, that's not great. We need to weigh, we need to weigh, we need to stay authentic, but we need players to be able to gamble and make just as much money doing that as they would at any of the other activities in the games. So because that, the players would just never gamble yeah, otherwise. Like why would you, uh -huh. like you might gamble because it's fun, but you'd be depressed that, that that was just a losing proposition. So I had to solve that and I loved my solution. It was basically creating a bunch of cheating systems <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and che cheating mini games because like the idea of, of getting away with cheating Vegas is a big trope anyway, right? And we're playing into tropes uh, in games like that. And so uh, for each of the games we were working on, um, Blackjack, uh, let's see, it was basically uh, Blackjack, Roulette, and Craps, and Slot Machines. And, and, and poker. poker, right? Yeah, really, yeah. Poker and Blackjack were the two big ones. So I'll, I'll talk about those. And what I wanted to do was come up with a system for cheating those games that allowed them to be profitable, but not any more profitable than anything else but also have some decisions. It's not just a press button, get gambling money. It's like, no, this is a sub game. This is a new layer of the, of the gambling game that you need to play to be able to do this. So the system I came up with was the idea of uh, 
hidden luminous ink and you had a certain number of times that you could mark cards, but you could only mark cards that you came into contact with. So you could mark cards in blackjack or in poker that were put in front of you. Uh, and then you only had a certain number of ink marks before you would run out and only a certain amount of time before uh, they would catch on to you. So you had to, a, you know, you had to work within a, a time range and then move on or else you'd get caught. And mm -hmm. uh, so for poker, it was kind of neat because you'd have to decide which, which, where to use your precious marks, right? Which is mainly on face cards and stuff. So whenever, you, maybe you'd get a six and just want to fold it. Uh, but you could mark the ace before you did. And then mm -hmm. in future deals, when that ace showed up in anybody else's hand, you'd know they have it, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that was a way to get an advantage. And then in uh, in Blackjack, uh, it, it was basically, there was authentic card counting, but then authentic, uh, you know, you had to do these card markings and it was kind of a skill game to get away with even marking the card at all. And... Uh, and anyway, it was really fun. Uh, it was really fun. It was just these layers of cheating that uh, were fair in terms of their profitability relative to other things, but really interesting in terms of how they change your decisions in the game. Um, but then my favorite design I've ever made, and it kind of <laughs> it, nobody ever saw. I played a lot of uh, one player poker games at the time because poker was in a huge boom and uh console games had all these poker games on them and I would play them and they were kind of miserable because the trouble with authentic poker is you fold 80, 90% of your hands. Right. And that's really boring to sit around digitally folding hands. It was just yeah. awful. And then I had this great idea and I still, it, oh, so sad that this didn't see the light of day. So in poker, uh, antes are largely replaced by blinds, which is to say forced bets that happen at the table and kind of move around the table. So the onus to make a forced bet moves around the table to be even across all the players. And so a lot of times what happens when you play poker is you fold, fold, fold. Oh, now I pay my blind. I fold again. Oh, now I played one hand or whatever. And you slowly get, they call it blinding you down. You know, you get blinded down, but it's it's all legit. So I said, what if we just skipped those hands. If we took the hands where you're obviously supposed to fold, we don't even show you your 8-3 offsuit. Heck, we don't even show mm -hmm. you your jack-7 offsuit, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we would just automatically fold those for you if you turn this on. This is a feature you could turn on. You turn on this feature, um, it blinds you. So if it passes you through a blind, it's going to deduct some money from your bankroll or whatever, but not a lot. And basically, it only ever showed you hands that were playable, but it was still authentic poker. So suddenly you had digital poker where every hand you got was playable, but it was not inauthentic. It was not uh, faking it in terms of giving you good hands. Yeah. And suddenly I was playing my own poker game on my lunch break, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, this is fun. Yeah. Ace king into ace jack into pocket sixes into, you know, nine, ten suited. It was just like hand after hand after hand that was actually interesting and fun to play. And everybody loved it. It was great. Like it was so good. And in fact, I think it was a it was a precursor to Rush Poker. Like this was before mm. the gambling sites figured out uh, how to basically do this for poker players as well. So I always thought that was neat that that, that I was oh, a little man. ahead of the curve on that. Sad. Unfortunately, nobody ever got to see it. But I thought I'd at least tell the listeners about it. That was one of you know I have some stuff I'm very proud of in my time at Wizards, of course, as well. But when I think about some of my favorite game designs that I've done. Sadly, a lot of it is from This is Vegas and none of you ever got to play it. <laughs>